Why are you guys always so negative? So do you just hate the church, or do you also hate Jesus and the gospel too? Don't you think it hurts the church more than it helps the church when you guys talk about these things? These are all real questions that we've been asked this week at Church Disrupted. People don't like it when we have tough conversations about abusive systems and toxic environments in the church. People don't like it when we talk about these things, but we have to talk about them because there's too much at stake not to. And on today's episode of the Church Disrupted Podcast, we're having a special conversation in honor of Holy Week where we ask the question, what's at stake if we don't have these conversations? And it's exactly what's at stake that drives these conversations and keeps us talking about tough things, even when people want to stop us. Because the bottom line is, there is way too much at stake to just keep letting spiritual abuse and these toxic and abusive environments in churches go. So we're going to have another conversation about some tough things today, but we're going to talk about why we have these conversations, why we're not going to quit, and why we are going to keep pushing for reform and health in the church. So if you're ready, let's jump into the Church Disrupted podcast together. All right, guys, welcome back to the Church Disrupted Podcast with your host, Jeff Cochran. Um, I'm here today with Abby Fleming and Vicki May as my co-host. Vicki, we're really glad to have you back. It's I'm glad been a to while. be back. It has been a um, while. Schedules don't always work out, which is mm-hmm. why we've got so many hosts. And uh, you're a teacher, so sometimes during the school year, That's it's right. harder. We're, we're just going to like record a bunch of episodes with you in the summer, so we got plenty of Vicki throughout the year. <laughs> I want to make sure we do that. Um but no, th- this is a n- unique podcast today because we normally put out podcasts on Mondays. Okay. Um, there have been a few times where I'm really behind and we put one out on Tuesdays. Okay. Cause this is not my full-time job. Okay. Um, we never put out a podcast on a Wednesday and it may happen this week because today is a Tuesday. This is Holy Week mm-hmm. and we're recording this podcast today and then I'm going to edit it and try to turn it around. We've never done that. We're normally, I've got weeks. The quickest I've done is one I wanted to get out that I had a full week to do, right? But the reason why we're doing this, we wanted to record a special episode for Holy Week and get off of our normal, um, kind of our normal topics we had planned, really good stuff, good interviews, talking about systems, talking about news stories, all that sort of stuff. We wanted to do something a little different and let Holy Week actually inform this conversation, right? Um, And I've always loved Holy Week, spent two decades in ministry but I think I enjoy Holy Week more, and it means more to me now outside of ministry than when I was in it, because Holy Week was so busy. The Easter season was so busy as a church yeah, staff. That's like a busy. Super Bowl, right? And for volunteers, too. Yeah. yeah. So you don't always have time to stop and think and process, yeah. versus now, yeah. you know, off-church staff, I've had years of just Easter week is a week to process, minus last week when my, or last year when my wife actually had to go through, you know, significant religious trauma herself that happened on Holy Week. Mm -hmm. Um, But outside of that, we we love Holy Week. So I'm thinking about just, you know, Christ and sacrifice and what he did. And how could that really affect and inform this podcast in a different way this week? And I really came up with an answer and a question. Christ and what he did on the cross is why we do this. Mm -hmm. We love the Mm -hmm. church. Yeah. We don't do this because yeah. we dislike the church. We don't do this because we hate the church. We do this because we love the church so much. But the church, the bride that Jesus died for, we love her too much to let the body hurt itself and to let to let people be hurt by wolves in sheep's clothing and by systems and things that we put above and elevate above Jesus, right? Because Jesus died so that we could be a unified body, so that we could be a whole body. So we got to protect the least of these. Mm -hmm. That's why we're having a lot of these conversations. Um, But I also had this question come up. What would happen if we didn't have these conversations? And the answer I came to was I would be complicit and a lot more of this sin, a lot more of hurting people. So we get a lot of pushback on social media and stuff like that, where we'll you know post clips, we'll post something. People think we're just being mean, we're just hurt. Um, so I get, you know, you're hurting the church. Um, you guys are hurting the church more than you're helping it. You guys are causing division. You get all of those, and we got pretty standard answers to those because we just don't agree with that, right? Um, 
But then I, I get a lot of these passive aggressive comments. I get comments like, um, who hurt you? And that'll be the only comment is who hurt you? Listen, validate everything you just said, because you must be speaking out of hurt. And while we've all had hurt to some degree, the majority of our hosts are not in current hurt. Uh, current hurt. They've walked through a lot of healing. Some of our hosts are still walking through a lot of hurt. It's more fresh, but we don't do this out of hurt. We don't do this as a response to our hurt. We do this as a response to the hurt that's yet to happen, right? So today's topic is what's at stake if we don't have these conversations as the church, not this podcast, okay? We don't think we're that special. What's at stake if we don't have these kind of conversations, these corrective conversations, these growth conversations about correcting systems and and things that allow abuse and cause abuse? What's at stake if we as the global Big C Church don't have those. And mm-hmm. it's a lot. It's a lot at stake. So we're going to look at the Bible. We're going to look at kind of the big picture. And we're going to look at just some personal stories that we've heard. But um, how, do you guys get any of that same feedback? And how do you respond when you get that feedback of you're, you're hurting the church more than you're helping it? Or when people say, you guys should just talk about something nicer? I don't know that I've gotten negative feedback directly. I think it's um, in ways that I see like I brought up earlier before we started the recording, the podcast was, you know, people unfriending you on social media, um, not reaching out to you, not checking in with you, um, who used to do that often. You did life together. People you're close with. That you thought you were close with. Um, I think that's a, in a way it's, it's, that is to me is very negative just with the people that you thought you were close to. Um, also just, um, you feel you feel forgotten because of the other people that you did life with that you volunteered with or um you know was in this community together um you you hear things i think i hear things more second hand third hand than directly uh most yeah. people that are reaching out to me thankfully are um positive supportive but also in their own set of hurt and so when they find out um that i've left uh, a certain church that they're like, oh, um, I've left too, or I didn't know you had left. You know, it's been things like that. So it's not been a, a direct. I, I think you're getting it more obviously because uh, this is your podcast. You're you're the man in charge, you know, and so I'm sure you're going to get a lot more directly. Um, but I haven't had a whole lot of negative directly to me, which I guess is is thankful. But I would be Yours prepared is more to just have local conversations. Yeah, I think it's more local conversations. I would be prepared. I I wouldn't mind having a, a conversation with people about that. You know, I mean, I, I'd be prepared for what was coming at me just because, you know, um, again, I'm not doing this. I mean, yes, I've been hurt, but I'm not doing it out as uh, being vindictive and trying to make somebody pay for my hurt. It's because I want all of us as a church to be better. So, yeah. well, and I don't think, you know, I don't think any of us have that heart. Like no one's trying to get vindication. No, no. one's trying to get revenge. Not what this is about. But we don't want to see the same hurt continue to perpetuate. No. And especially mm-hmm. when you're talking about, you know, big time scandal and abuse. Right? Yes. Um, what about you, Abby? Yeah. So um, first of all, I just don't look at feedback. <laughs> good because, for you <laughs> yeah, because because it does you know it, it does um as much as I want to power through things it it still is a dart to your heart um and it oh, yeah. still hurts so it's a whole nother mm-hmm. level of hurt and the point is not to be hurting each other brothers mm-hmm. and sisters in Christ yeah. and the bride of Christ and we as a church are a family um, we're supposed to be and family's messy and people mm. get hurt in family um, but no I just I don't I don't look at feedback um, and but it does show mm. how passionate and how important that these conversations really oh, are yeah. because if people no matter what side you're on and we should all be on the same side we're supposed but to be yeah if people are putting themselves in different camps by their own definition mm-hmm. so when they are um first of all that's already wrong but if you're on that other side it's because both people care so passionately about the same thing yeah. um and if we had more open conversations about this where people's heart for each other and for oh, Christ, yeah. then it wouldn't be so much of negative feedback. It would maybe be more conversational. Uh, so, yeah, and that's what we're after a lot. 
a lot on social media, I'll say, hey, can we start again? Can we have a conversation? Um, you led with an attack. Um, you know, I, I don't want to do that. I don't want to argue. But so, you know, we're in the process of going beyond just Church Disrupted. Church Disrupted is going to be a part of a much larger nonprofit. Okay, so Church Disrupted, the podcast, has been about awareness. Okay, um, the podcast has been a little bit about education, and the community has been a little bit about you know education as well. But we're starting a nonprofit called the Spiritual Abuse Institute. Okay, it is it's, it's already started in the state of Tennessee. We're getting our five hundred one c three paperwork in, which takes a while. Um, we got our bylaws ready to go, but we still got to have our first board meeting and all that sort of stuff. But what we're doing is we're going to focus on awareness, education, research, and resources for both churches and people to heal, right? Mm -hmm. um, so again, we don't want to just stay on the, the awareness side because that can seem more negative because if you're talking about awareness of spiritual abuse, it's going to seem negative, mm -hmm. right? Sure. But we've got to have awareness this stuff is going on because one of the things I hear most often is, well, but that's not all churches. No, it's not all churches. Mm -hmm. But these systems and things that are causing them happen at a lot of churches. So then someone will say, but it's not my church. Just because you haven't experienced something, just because you haven't experienced a hurt or a trauma, mm -hmm. you haven't experienced something at your church, or your place of worship, doesn't mean that doesn't happen to other people. So to dismiss something because you haven't seen it or you haven't experienced it is damaging and hurtful to the people who have experienced it and the people who will experience it. So one of the things that helps us in these conversations is when we can have a conversation about something that's different than our experience and have empathy and simply say, you know what, I've never experienced that, but that breaks my heart that other people have. Okay. Instead, we get a lot of people who, they, if they haven't had that experience, they simply say, well, that's not true because I've never seen it. Right. Um, we're not it, allowed to talk about it. Yeah. It was that's never true thing. for us until we experienced it. Mm -hmm. But then we've seen how many people have experienced it and some of us have experienced it multiple times. Right. Yeah. And, and we're not allowed to talk about it where it's, it's a shameful thing. You know, if you've been hurt by the church, you've heard your entire life, most likely that you're not, that it's just you, it, you know, don't, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You hear all of these dismissive phrases, which had the, have their purpose to yeah. certain situations where people do just throw everything out. Um, mm -hmm. but we're not allowed to talk about it, Yeah, you know? And so you, you, it, I'd say it probably happens at every church. Something happens. Somebody gets hurt at every church because we're all sinners yeah. and we all make mistakes and leadership makes mistakes. Yeah. But we don't know because people aren't necessarily mm -hmm. talking about it. And it may not be spiritual abuse at every church right? because church hurt yes. and spiritual abuse are different. But when one part of the body hurts, all parts of the body should hurt. It right? should. Um, but should. And what we're not, we what we're never saying is that any church that's had like spiritual abuse or church hurt should shut down. That's not what we're saying. What we're saying is, hey, let's learn how to recognize it, mm -hmm. how to fix yeah. it, how to repent, how to get better, right? But again, people people have been told for so long, either you're crazy and it's just you, or you're taking too much of an offense, right? Yeah. So it's either you got a spirit of offense you need to fix, or Yes, that bad thing happened to you, but you're causing division and disunity by talking about it, right? So what we do is we never talk about it. And just yesterday, we actually had an interview with Chelsea Brooke Cole, who literally wrote the book on narcissism, okay? She is one of the world's experts on narcissism and healing from it. We're not going to air it for a while, so that's just a little bit of a teaser. But I did it yesterday, and she talked about that. She said the narcissistic response is to gaslight you and make you feel crazy or to tell you you're going to hurt people and be disloyal if you don't do these things. Now, does that mean that people who say that on social media are narcissists? No, most of them aren't. But what they're doing is they're defending the system. Why are they defending the system? When you have to defend a system in those ways, it's because what she talked about, it's because they are narcissistic systems. And Abby, you were on an episode we did recently about narcissistic systems in the church. And one of the pieces of feedback I got from a lot of people is they said, narcissistic systems aren't a thing. You can have a narcissistic person. You can't have a narcissistic system. You guys are making this stuff up, right? So I asked Chelsea about it yesterday, and she's like, I've never heard anyone say there aren't narcissistic systems, <laughs> right? right? Interesting. Um, yeah. But again, the, the reason why we push back on that is because the system is designed to protect itself. And the systems, a lot of times, we've talked about quite a few of them that people get mad about, but a lot of our church systems, they, they attach our, themselves to our faith identity. So... When we feel like someone's attacking our church or our system, they're attacking our identity. They're attacking, we feel like they're attacking our Savior when that's not what's happening. No. That's a problem right? in and of itself. Right. Yeah, which right. is why conversations have to happen. But we're starting this nonprofit, and here's the reason why I'm saying this. 
as we start this nonprofit, it's to do more. But one of our values is we lead the way. So when we're pushing on churches about transparency and finances, we have to lead the way in that, which means we'll have 100% open books at all times. Donors can request open books at all times. Know exactly where we're at. Day one, when we are severely negative, right? Mm -hmm. When we are still functioning off of me just giving money to this thing and time to this thing, we're going to have those open books. But the other thing, that's why I'm on social media. And that's where I was getting to, Abby, is I'm on social media standing in the gap for this when other team members can't. Sometimes I'll have people give me a break and respond. But we want to respond because you never know when you're going to have someone, some of the stories I talk about later that we need to respond to. We try to respond to everything. We still can't. But I want to lead the way. And one of our kind of values as a podcast has always been we want conversation, not consensus. So I don't always get it right. I mess up. I get defensive, right? But I'm I'm answering a lot more of that than I want to because I just want to turn the notifications off a lot of times. (laughs) But I'm answering it because we want to lead the way and and you know, say, Hey, we got to have these conversations. So let's talk about why we got to have these conversations. What's at stake. Okay. Um, when you think about it biblically, so we're going to start biblically, we're going to go big picture, and then we're going to go to some personal stories of why these conversations matter, even when they're uncomfortable. When you think about biblically talking about spiritual abuse, narcissistic systems, spiritually abusive systems, church hurt, anything that's causing people to be hurt in the body by the body, right? Um, Again, there's this fear that it causes disunity. There's this fear that we could we should handle everything behind closed doors. But biblically, when you look at it, um, what do you feel like the Bible actually says to you about these conversations and why we have to have them? What's at stake biblically? Well, the two things that come to mind, um, first of all, Jesus is passionate, super, more passionate than we are about his church, about his bride. I mean, this is his future. And we are we're being made spotless right now, which is a painful thing. We're mm-hmm. like in open heart surgery and yeah. I mean all of our limbs are having surgery on it right now yeah. this year in the body of Christ. Mm-hmm. I truly believe that. So there's a lot of pain mm-hmm. and we don't know how to recover. That's why we're talking about this stuff cuz really the focus is recovery, but you can't recover when you don't know you need to recover from something if you don't recognize, "Oh, I do have an open wound and maybe right. I need to be in a safe place for a minute and there's no shame in that and that's mm-hmm. not a rejection to anybody." That's one of the you things know? Chelsea said yesterday was you can't heal until you've actually told your story and yeah. named that hurt out loud. Right. Yeah. Ooh, I don't like doing that. Um, <laughs> but uh, but I, I just, I think this is so important because it's so important to Christ. Mm-hmm. That's why. Um, and this is people's lives and their souls at stake um, with how they interact with Jesus. Uh, and we don't want... We don't want the body of Christ to be preventing anyone from seeing the true Christ mm-hmm. and and knowing what's important. Um, but the thinking of how passionate Jesus is, of course, obviously he died on the cross so that we could be with him. Um, yeah. So that shows his passion. But even when the church was building, and I don't claim to be a biblical scholar, so I'm not going to get all these names right. You can fix me. Yeah. Um, but uh, Sapphira, whoever, um, the people that came and lied about the tithe. Yeah. Ananias and Sapphira. Yes. Hey, yeah. I got it right. Uh, you know, they. It, it seems very harsh. That story seems a little bit like, ooh, is that real? God would just zap. Somebody and let, let's just dead? stop real quick because I had your your husband on the episode where we talked about tithing. That was an offering, okay. not a tithe, because sure. that that still got people <laughs> triggered when we talk about yep. tithing. So. Okay. Yep. Yep. so um, but the the question is like, I can't believe God would just drop somebody dead like that. You know, I mean, they were trying to be with him, right? I mean, mm-hmm. they they weren't nece- they weren't wicked, evil people. Um, the and zap and the the my favorite answer was that it shows, it went to show the passion that God has to protecting the body of Christ, to protecting Mm -hmm. his church, because he doesn't, he wants us, if we have any dark spots and blemishes in us, Mm -hmm. then that that puts that prevents us from fully experiencing something that the Lord has for us um, and being able to love him back Mm -hmm. fully loving each other yeah. fully. So there's so it's so important to him to the point of death. Yeah. That his own death, death his own death. Nice fire. Yeah. So um so yeah, that's just Jesus is passionate about this. Yeah. So that's we are all passionate about this too. Mm-hmm. 
And you think about Jesus flipping the tables, you know, in the temple, Jesus was willing to upend the institution and the religious leaders that he was supposed to submit to, Mm -hmm. right? He was willing to do that and it not be sin Mm -hmm. because Jesus was also more about protecting people than the institution. And when we talk about the bride of Christ from a biblical perspective, the bride of Christ was always the people of God, the ecclesia or the ecclesia, however you want to say it. Some Mm -hmm. people pronounce it different ways. The ecclesia is the gathering, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The ecclesia wasn't a building or an institution for hundreds of years, right? So when we talk about this, yes, Jesus was always willing to go against the institution to protect the people. So sometimes when we... um, when we say things about what's going wrong and needs to be corrected in the institution that is hurting the people, then that's when we get the feedback of you're just hurting the bride of Christ. You're just hurting the church. You're just causing division. No, 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 no. There's a difference between the institution and the people. And the institution will always need more correction than the people. The institution is going to show sometimes the worst of us. And we've always got to protect the people in the gathering rather than the institution that brings us together, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's a big piece that we have to pay attention to as well. And, uh, you know, given a a lot of kind of looks ahead to interviews we got coming up, but we sat down with Nathan Apfel and Chris Ayub from the religion business, the seven part documentary that's coming out, you know, in the fall. And that's what they talked about when we we're talking about these finance things, right? We're not against the church, but what we need people to do before they can have this conversation is to separate the institution Mm -hmm. from the ecclesia. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And we had that conversation as well. So, um, we, we got to be able to do that because we have to hold institutions accountable and people in those accountable um, for the sake of the body, for the sake of the gathering. So, um, Vicki, anything you want to add, anything biblically that sticks out? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, I would like to tack on to what you were saying about um, I, about Je- you know, our relationship with Jesus. That's, that's key to me, you know, our relationship, not just individ- as individuals, but as a church as a body, and um, to say that, uh, you know, Jesus is the ultimate example of love. Yeah. He is love. And if we, I mean, and if we've all been in a relationship with people, which we do, we're human beings, love is hard sometimes uh, with the flesh, the human flesh, um, it shouldn't be hard with Jesus. So, you know, it shouldn't be a difficult thing with Jesus. We should be able to connect with him. But if we see his people that say they are followers of him and his love and they are hurting people, then, um, and that's the example that we're given, that's that's not okay. Yeah. And then when we're not willing to have these tough conversations, those tough conversations have been given, there's parameters put in place biblically that's right. For us to be able to talk as a body mm-hmm. of Christ to with each other and for each other. And so um, those are two big things that stick out to me biblically. Yeah. Um, I mean, he gave the ultimate sacrifice to have a relationship with us, to give us the free will to choose to accept him as our savior. Um so why can't we accept each other's hurt and have co- tough conversations? So, yeah. and one of the things that, that I hear, especially like for instance, Abby, you know, you were on a podcast recently where we talked about, um, you know, I had a clip that we played about dream teams and about the dream team language and how the dream team language or the winning team language. Yeah, we talked about team. different examples, um, mm. but we said how that language can can be hurtful. It creates an unnecessary dichotomy that either hurts people because they feel like they're left on the outside, or more importantly, it hurts people because it leads to volunteer exploitation because the only way I can please God is I got to be on the dream team, winning team, right? So mm-hmm. we, we talked about that. But in that clip, instead of people asking questions or trying to understand, we had a lot of church leaders and Christians who are a part of you know churches doing this who said, well, maybe they're just trying to celebrate their volunteers. Maybe they're just trying to love their volunteers, right? Um, have true. you ever thought about that? Yes, yes, we have, we do. right? Of course we do. And, and, and they would say <laughs> things, and sometimes mean, and sometimes not. Sometimes, yeah. you know, very good. So I'm just going to sanitize all of this. Um, but they would often say things like, well, I don't think that's the intent. 
It's not I think the, the intent was just to celebrate. Right. I think the intent was yeah. just to love. I think the intent was to do something fun for your volunteers. And that was my response. Mm-hmm. Abby was, mm-hmm. no, 100%. I don't think anybody's ever had the intent to hurt people mm-hmm. by using dream team language or winning mm-hmm. team language or anything like that. But it's the result. And when we find out that someone has been unintentionally hurt by it, it should only take one person to be hurt by it that we're willing to have the conversation and say, what could we change in how we talk about this mm-hmm. to make that change? Now, then, of course, we get people who will say, you know, well, isn't it the same thing with volunteering or serving? Well, no, because if I'm not on a volunteer team, it just means I'm not volunteering at the church. Right. If I'm not on yeah. a serve team, it just means I didn't serve. Neutral. It's about an action I took or didn't take. Mm-hmm. When you're talking about a dream team or a winning team, it's about an identity I have or don't have. Mm-hmm. Right. It's about a station that I have or don't have. So again, that's just the reminder. It's sometimes the things that we're talking about, people are going to get upset because they say that's not the intent. And we understand that's not the intent, Mm -hmm. but it's result and action, not intent that we have to measure because you know, the, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Right, right, right. Right? Well, that's what I was thinking about. I was like, you have to not just look at it from your own perspective. You have to look at it from someone else's perspective. And that was the biggest thing for me the the one time the last time that I was part of a volunteer team and they used this terminology and they handed out the t-shirts and I just got sick to my stomach thinking of putting that t-shirt on with that slogan on it you know the, the slogan on it and I'm just like mm-hmm. because I thought what is this saying to other people who aren't on this team yeah. You know, like and that I, wasn't a dream team. That was a winning team, which is why. Yeah, right. You know, is this what I'm saying? It's like it, it was very it made me feel uncomfortable. It made me question things immediately. I'd already been going through some through some things, you know, questioning whether I could stay and be a part and, and all those things. And so that was just kind of almost like a nail in the coffin situation where I'm. But but the biggest thing, I mean, it was personal, obviously, how I was dealing with that, but also looking at it from someone else's outside perspective or someone who's not on that team's perspective. Or like a first time guest. Like, what is this? Yes. Yeah. Any, but like, what are we, what kind of message are we sending here? And again, I'll and speak. Would Jesus be okay with this? Yeah. And I, I don't think so. I had a lot of the same, you know, concerns. And again, whether it's, whether it's that, you know, winning team, dream team, there's a lot of different monikers. Um, they tend to have the same issues. But I, I, I know a lot of the people who are behind that. And as much as they may think I hate them, I don't. And I can, I can tell you, they didn't have bad intentions behind that. No. There's no bad intentions behind that at all. But again, we have to measure results. We have mm-hmm. to measure mm-hmm. actions, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but let's talk about, like, you know, just, I'll give you kind of my thoughts biblically on this, right? And it's a few different things, okay? Mm-hmm. Um, because I, you know, I have a person who literally I'm close enough to them, did their wedding, who basically just wrote me off the other day, said I'm unrepentant because, you know, and they, they said this, they said, until you repent, and I'm basically not having another conversation with you because um, you have taken this out in the public arena, right? And you're not following biblical protocol. So what does biblical protocol say? Because, you know, Vicki, you talked about it. We do have a, a biblical standard, right, for how we handle issues in the church. Well, we got Matthew 18. Matthew 18, I'm not going to read it. I'm going to paraphrase it just because we talked about it a lot on the podcast so far. But in Matthew 18, you know, it says, the heading says church discipline. Just another reminder Headings weren't put in the Bible originally. Headings have come in the last like few hundred years. Okay, headings are man-made. So the heading says church discipline, but the passage is not about church discipline. The church wasn't even a thing yet. Okay, can we just say yeah. Jesus yeah. didn't go to the cross? That That's right. The church yeah. didn't exist. Yeah. But what Jesus was talking about was he was talking about how do we handle conflict with a brother? Right. Mm-hmm. With relationships. This was just about. Other. Conflict, godly conflict, right? Mm-hmm. And how do we handle conflict with a brother when you actually look at the word Jews? The the the, the kind of insinuation there, the 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 context that you take it in is these are peers. Like it's us around this table. We're our we're all peers. Nobody's in charge, mm-hmm. right? The only in charge I am is I can hit the record button, right? You know, but th- we're all in the same playing field. Okay. So yes, if one of you sins against me. I'm going to go to you, as Matthew 18 says, one-on-one and say, Abby, you sinned against me. Why'd you do that? That really hurt. Okay. And if Abby says, Jeff, I'm so sorry. I didn't, I didn't even mean, I didn't even think about that. That was not my intent. I don't think it was your intent at all. I just wanted to let you know it hurt me. Oh, what, what can I do in the future? So that doesn't happen. I'm so sorry. Well, you know, I'm sorry. Maybe I shouldn't have taken it 
so hard, but I don't want to have this conversation. And no, I'm glad we did have this conversation, right? Mm -hmm. That's how that goes. Mm -hmm. That's a repentant conversation. Mm -hmm. That's what Matthew 18 is talking about most of the time. But Jesus does say, if they refuse to hear you or repent, then take a witness or two with you. So Abby, with you, if I try to talk to you about that and you go, that wasn't my intent, bozo. Don't be so soft. Don't be such a snowflake. Mm -hmm. Jesus, it's an election year. Put your helmet on, you know, and, <laughs> and, and you just say mean things, yeah. okay? Yeah. And you walk away. Well, then I might come back with Vicky, mm -hmm. you know, and I might come back with Buck mm -hmm. and say, hey, I'm not against you, Abby, but that really was hurtful. And then your response was hurtful, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and they could say, Abby, why are you so defensive over this? Like, Jeff's got a point. We all love you, right? But Jeff's, Jeff's hurt over this thing. Y'all need to reconcile, okay? And then if that doesn't work, we can take another couple of witnesses or we take it before the church. That's where we get the church discipline. We take it before the gathering, right? And in those days, they would gather at the synagogues every single week. So it was basically, we're going to take it to the most public place we can and go, here's what's going on. Abby's calling people bozos and telling them to put on their helmets and she's not repented. So we're just not having conversations with her until she figures this out, right? Just don't have conversations with Abby because she ain't ready, right? And it says that essentially we treat them like they're not a part of the gathering, mm -hmm. right? Like, um, or we treat them, you know, as, as Paul says, like an unbeliever, right? Um, which means you don't have special privileges and all that. So when we talk about churches or we talk about pastors that have been unrepentant, they have publicly been unrepentant after sin, they don't have the special protection of the gathering or the pastor, they're just a person out there who has hurt people. Actually, worse, they're a person who's supposed to be a part of the gathering but isn't, right? So we need to try to restore them. We need to try to bring them back. But until they're repentant, they have no special protections, right? And that's part of part of what James 5, 19 and 20 talks about. James says, my brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone bring that person back, remember this, Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their ways, and this is a sinner who is a part of the gathering, will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. So if what it takes to save someone from their sins mm -hmm. is to publicly start saying, hey, you can't do this. You have to repent. You can't be in the pulpit until you repent because it's hurt people. That is actually good for them. Mm -hmm. Okay, It's good for the church. It's good for everyone. But it doesn't feel good. Mm -hmm. right? It doesn't mm -hmm. feel good at all. Um, but then I also think about this. I think about what is biblically, what does the New Testament say about the church itself? Because Matthew 18 wasn't about the church itself. That bothers people. Mm -hmm. Okay. But also what does 1 Timothy say about leaders and overseers? Mm -hmm. What does the Bible say about it? Because Matthew 18 was about peers. Okay. Not about leaders. And I can tell you, you guys have heard my story. If you've listened from the beginning, you listened from episode one. Um, when we come against pastors and elder boards and church systems that are trying to protect themselves, that is not that's not peer. Right. That is difficult. They can shut you down. So if a, a lot of times we'll have church leaders who will push Matthew 18 to keep people quiet because they know Matthew 18 doesn't work when they're the ones with power. Okay. Um, and in our case, Matthew 18 was refused. Matthew 18 was refused the entire process. We couldn't have it because no one was willing to have that conversation or get the person in that accountability conversation, okay? So when it's a pastor, an elder, an overseer, what does the Bible say? First Timothy 3 gives us the qualifications for overseers and deacons, okay? Now remember, overseers overseeing the church, deacons were the ones that were serving the church, mm -hmm. Okay. And it talks about this. It says, 1 Timothy 3, 2, the very first requirement, the overseer is to be above reproach. Above reproach means irreproachable. It means if someone brings an allegation, all I got to do is bring just a minor amount of evidence and it doesn't stand, mm -hmm. right? right? So if someone tries to bring an allegation and they're like, Jeff's being unfaithful to his wife, I'm like, ha, 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 I have so many rules in place to where I couldn't be unfaithful to my wife. If you bring that allegation, I'm going to embarrass you publicly, right? Because we got systems. We got systems to protect Jeff from stepping in stupid. Not because I think I'm smart, because I think I'm not, okay? Right? Um, or you say, oh, well, you know, this person was over here and they did this, you know? Okay, well, let's let's take a look at it. Or, hey, you got this financial sin or whatever. Okay, let's just open up my bank account. I'll show you my bank account right now. I don't care, right? So when, you, when you're above reproach, someone brings a reproach and you just stand. You so say, well, here's the evidence. I don't know water. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. Right. That's what it means to be above reproach. That no one can actually bring something to you that would stick. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so what that doesn't mean is that someone brings something, you go, no comment. <laughs> you don't have all the context. Okay. Read the fifth. That's the very first thing though. So any pastor we talk about by name or church that we talk about by name here has already proven themselves not above reproach, which means they are not currently qualified for ministry until they repent. Mm-hmm. Period. So that's not, again, it's not us hurting the bride. It's actually us saying, hey, you know, we are talking about this so that we can learn from it. But we're also talking about this because, for instance, you know, Mark Driscoll, and I put a post up about him this week, you know, a story about, you know, we need to keep people like this out of our churches. And I had people who came back and said, but we love the way he preaches. He's a gifted preacher. I like some of the things he said as a preacher, but it doesn't matter. He's not above reproach. Right. So he doesn't need to be in the pulpit. He left Mars Hill. Thousands of people get hurt. His elders have still said to this day, he has not repented. He's not fit to be in ministry. He goes, starts a new church in Phoenix, Arizona, Trinity Church. He's all over social media now. They're already repeating some of the same things, NDAs, abusive leadership. All of those allegations have come out. So we're not hurting the unity of the church when we say you don't need to support Mark Driscoll. When you see him on social media, just swipe away, right? Someone tagged him in one of our posts. I said, don't tag that dude. Mm-mm. He's an abuser, right? <laughs> Others got mad and said, well, oh, you're, you're being disunity. Have you ever talked to him? I don't need to talk to him. The facts are already out there. His response, which was unrepentant, is already out there. He is not above reproach. He is not qualified for ministry. It is a protective thing for the church to say that person's not qualified for ministry. And we're not mad at Mark Driscoll. No, we're I'll go have lunch broken, with Mark. Broken, Never hearted. met Mark. Yeah, you know, we're and, and that's the thing. We're brokenhearted for people that are abusers because <clears throat> mercy. It's I easy. Mean, it's easy to become one in the church. Yes, and. A lot of times the people might be unrepentant because they don't believe they've done anything wrong. So then they're under deception. I mean, there's so many things. And so we break our heart breaks for people yeah. that are in those situations mm-hmm. and um, that are just so it's really deception. I don't know if it's yeah. anything more than that. Um, but it's that's just powerful. So deceived. You know, so I, I, I posted what I posted about him this week was I just reposted a story from the Roy's report about him, you know, telling a story about the angry sermon that was featured so much, you know, in a um, rise and fall on Mars Hill. And from his perspective, it was, well, I only said that at like one. And it was because I just heard, you know, somebody toward the end of the day, I was tired and I'd heard about all these abusive situations, these women being sexually assaulted. And I was just mad. So when I screamed into that microphone, who the hell do you think you are all angry? It was, it was because I was angry over the sim, Mm -hmm. right? And then not only did the Roy's report confirm this, they, you know, uh, Mike Cosper and his work with the rise and fall of Mars Hill confirmed it. Everybody who was there that day said that he said it every service. It was made for TV. It was scripted. I had someone, I had, well, multiple people in my inbox. And one, one of them, I'll just give you one example, said, yeah, I was a drummer that day. And he said that every single service. And I had people in my family who didn't go to church who came that day and then never come back. Right? So again, the deception, Mark may even believe that, but it doesn't match the facts, right. which means... He's not qualified for ministry. And if we don't warn people at Trinity Church, if we don't warn people on social media, like my brother and sister-in-law, you know, sent me a clip one day, you know, back in the summer, because they're like, oh, this is really good. And it was from him. And I said, the clip's good, but don't support that guy. Why? And they're like, why? He's really good. I'm like, he's an abuser. And here's why. Here's what you can go look at. So again, above reproach is the number one qualification. So if you're able to be reproached easily or you haven't answered to reproach, you're not qualified for ministry. We got to protect the church from you until you've repented, right? I'll give you some of these others. Um, faithful to their spouse, temperate, self-controlled, okay? And again, Mark is a good example of this. I'm not picking on Mark, but one of the big issues was he wasn't temperate. He was angry and he wasn't self-controlled, okay? Um, I get a lot of people on social media with pastor in their bio. They say stuff and I'm like, where's the self-control here? Like you just, you just ripped me a new one. You didn't ask any questions. You don't know me, right? You, 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 you just went straight for an attack to my identity. That's, a That's not self-control. That's epidemic in the church right, right? now. Yeah, unfortunately. Um, respectable, yeah. hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle. We got a lot of violent people in pulpits, let's be honest, mm-hmm. even in their language, not quarrelsome. So the ones that come out and want to fight all day on social media, it's like, well, I'm not a pastor right now, but you are. Why, like, why are you coming to fight? Like, why are, you, why are you coming to fight over this thing constantly? Like, we let's agree to disagree. We're three comments deep. There's no reason to keep doing this, right? Um, <laughs> not a lover of money. We have talked on this podcast and through the documentaries, there's a lot of lovers of money out there. We got to call that out. That's really why we talk about finances sense. so much. And I'm 
guys, I'm so pumped for that interview to share that with you guys from the religion business. Nathan and Chris did such a good job talking about church finances. Um, but it says uh, he must manage his own family well, see that his children obey him. Like basically, you can take care of your family first. Um, and he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. Okay. So basically, what it talks about that worthy of full respect, um, if you look at other translations, it'll say must have a good reputation with outsiders. Okay. Again, let's go back to that Mark Driscoll example. He does not have a good reputation with outsiders if they know anything about him. His reputation is only good to people who don't know his history. Right. So, again, biblically, What's at stake if we don't talk about these things is people who are unqualified for ministry keep doing ministry, and they keep hurting people in the same way. So let's use that same example on Mark Driscoll. Things like NDAs and uh, talks of abusive leadership and high-control environment, those are some of the biggest accusations levied against him. Um, His anger, his lack of self-control, all those sort of things, that's why he was removed from Mars Hill. All of those allegations have been brought up and made by people who were a part of Trinity in just a few years, they've been a church, yeah. right? So again, what's at stake if we don't handle these things when we can? They will grow and more people will get hurt. More people will get abused. More people will leave the church. Like that drummer who reached out to me and said, I had family members coming that day and they never went back to church, okay? There's a lot at stake. And we can't just say that's on Mark Driscoll. We can't just say that's on those elders, we have to say, no, 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 no. If I'm liking it on social media or seeing people like it on social media and I'm not saying, whoa, watch out for this guy, I'm complicit and I bear responsibility. Last thing I'll say biblically, right? And then we'll kind of move on and just talk about some stories at what's at stake because you know we're, we're low on time today. This is going to be a quick podcast. Um, most of the New Testament is correction to the church. Okay, let's think about Paul. Paul's correcting the Corinthians. He's, he's correcting a lot of churches or he's writing to churches about correcting other churches. Okay, not only that, Jesus in Revelation, Revelation opens up pretty early on, chapter three, with Jesus sending seven letters of correction to the churches. Now, Mm -hmm. two of those letters weren't correction, if I remember correctly. Five were. Okay. And the five were that were correction, what I mean, it was it was rough. And these were real churches. So we we try to make them all figurative. You know, no, the church of Sardis was a real church. The church of Laodicea was a real church church. Okay. So Jesus is bringing correction to those churches. So I've had people who have been like, well, but you can't bring the correction publicly. So I asked them, okay, well, the, the revelation was given. The Bible was given. We got the Bible who I think we would all say is for unbelievers and believers. You don't have to believe before you ever read the Bible. So that's out there publicly, the best selling book of all time. And it's got Jesus, our savior, who we claim never sinned. That's my belief, who after the resurrection is telling John to pin these letters to these churches, correcting them. So we can't say that's sinful unless we're saying Jesus is sinful, right? But what Jesus also did, it's a model we're trying to follow that, guys, we we don't always get right. But the model that Jesus gave us was correct, but then say, here's what you can do. I know what you can do. I know who you could be. And that's why we're starting the Spiritual Abuse Institute, because we want to make sure that we're always talking about the solutions and not just the problem. We try even on every podcast to get to solutions. Sometimes that doesn't come across the way that we want it to, right? Um, But that's kind of the model. So biblically, we got to talk about these things. Biblically, we've got to be able to bring correction when things are happening, because that's that's all throughout scripture. But let's start thinking about actual people, people you know, people you've heard of, news stories you've heard of. What's at stake What's at stake? What's happening to people if we don't have these conversations? What's the abuse, the scandals, the church hurt that's going to continue? Well, for me personally, I can speak to uh, my trust in people is not good right now. I think there are safe people that I know that I can still have, you know, tough conversations with thankfully like you Jeff I appreciate what you're doing here um there are our family members there are friends that I know that are true friends that I can have tough conversations with but there's there's a broken down uh trust for me Mm -hmm. and it keeps me guarded and I don't want to allow myself to be vulnerable to people yeah um and and vulnerable to a system, I don't, I'm, I am, 
I feel like I am not using my gifts or my potential like I should be for Jesus because I'm I'm fearful, I'm scared, I'm hesitant, all those things. Um, it, it's changed me as a person for right now. The things that I have to work through. And that's just at a personal example, my personal yeah. experience so currently. a lot of fear, anxiety, guilt, shame that wasn't there before that wasn't you're having before. to heal from. Correct. And so, and I'm, and that's just me. I know there's many other people in similar situations, and that's a problem. Because it's, uh, thankfully, I don't have to be in a church community to have a relationship with Jesus. That's a per- I can have a one-on-one personal relationship with Jesus, thankfully, that none of that is ever tainted or changed. I know mm-hmm. Jesus is still uh, my Savior, my friend. However, when you break down the community of people, the church, that are supposed to be united in your belief, that that's a problem. That's a huge problem. Once you've been hurt, by your own body, mm-hmm. Once your own body's betrayed you. Um, it changes things. Mm-hmm. It changes the trust. You know, like right now, I've got a, a pup, our little trauma dog, you know, sitting here. He's he's got cancer. You know, his body's betraying him. His mm-hmm. own body is killing his own body, mm-hmm. right? Um, and there's no correction we can bring because it's too late. So all we can do mm-hmm. is see how long we got left with him. My son <clears> just <throat> had a thumb injury. Right, bad thumb injury, um, tore a ligament out of his thumb, broke the bone. Well, we're having surgery tomorrow. Why are we having surgery tomorrow? We're having surgery because we got to fix it. Because if we don't fix it, he'll lose use of that thumb. Right? Um, there was a wound, but if we'll fix it, if we'll bring healing, it's gonna hurt. Mm-hmm. It's gonna be uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. He's gonna have to miss things he wanted to do for weeks. Right? But it's the only way to heal. And that's, I think, that's the example. If we don't speak to these things going on in churches, then that hurt continues to perpetuate, Vicky. It does. Until it gets to the point to where it's, can we fix it in the current system? And then our Versus people, if we fix it now, that healing hurts, but it's worth it. And people will, will walk away. There will be, and there has been, people who have walked away from the faith. They've walked away from their friends, family. Their, it has changed people and not in a good way. And that's a problem. So according to the great de-churching, um, so I haven't gotten deep into the book, but it's one I'm just starting. They say they, you know, nobody had really done great research on where the church was at. Barna's got some research. All the research is out there says people are hemorrhaging from the church right now. Mm-hmm. But they said this. They did a really rigorous study. We are currently experiencing the largest and fastest religious shift in U.S. history. It's greater than the first and second great awakening and every revival in our country combined. Wow. But it's in the opposite direction. Mm-hmm. So we, we can say a lot of things about hurting the church and moving people away from the church, but right now more people are leaving the church in America than have ever left the church, and a lot of it is because of the scandal, it's because of the lies, it's because of the abuse we haven't dealt with, the fouls we haven't called. Um, and again, Gen Z especially is looking for something different. I talk to millennial pastors every day who have left. They're some of our best and brightest who should be taking the reins of leadership, and they say, I haven't left Jesus no. But I've left ministry until I figure out what is right because all I know is what we were doing is not right. That is not what God has called us I to. I hear right? that often. They've too. seen those systems. So um, again, if we don't do something, the church will never die. The church will never die. But if we don't do something and correct it, the way we know church today will. Mm-hmm. Right? Yes. So I would rather correct it and redeem what's redeemable about the institution than not. You can go back to church history though, right? We celebrate the Reformation every year. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're not Orthodox or Catholic, we wouldn't be having this conversation if it wasn't for the Reformation. Yet Martin Luther, he put that 95 Thesis up publicly. He put it up on the day when everybody would see it. Not only that, it was because of the printing press that that kept going around that we had a Reformation. We need a Reformation. Yeah, We need a Reformation yeah. of these systems. And that was made public, yeah. not and, hidden in a side side conversation. Exactly. And that and <laughs> most of the 95 Thesis was, it was abuses that were hurting people. It was, you know, things um, like indulgences and stuff like that, right? So there's a lot there. What, what about you, Abby? You, you got some people close to you that are going through things right now, so you you really know what's at stake here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's it it's hard not to cry just thinking about it because <clears throat> families, children, the future, um, 
what our children believe Gen Alpha is coming up now mm-hmm. yeah. and what they are going to walk away with, um, knowing about God is what we represent to them now. Um, so um, I have one of my best friends is going through this huge scandal, um, unspeakable pedophilia, um, huge ring, and it's man, to uncover these things, if you knew how hard it is to uncover these things and how slow the process is. And, and this while was the, a church she trusted, was a part was, of? This was best friends since college, mm. a group of people um, that they have all known each other since college, um, and they're now in their 40s. Mm. So this is a big deal. And then the thing is, is that Yes, we now know, and it's still we're still waiting for all the evidence to prove it. Um, yeah. But we're still waiting for the major things to come out. But what was happening along the way was tons of this abuse stuff, the power abuse that could have been corrected There's, easily. Yes, or and and even as red flags, because that's the thing when you come to somebody um, for correction, mm-hmm. and if they're true and genuine. They're going to, they might even say no to your face and kind of get offensive, but then Mm -hmm. in their private time with the Lord, the Lord's going to start working too, and things are going to shift. And what happened is if that person, you come to that person because things were coming to light, and that's why they wanted this, my friend, out of the church. They did everything. They even, they even orchestrated her divorce and put forth another person that her husband now married. Um, like it's, it's crazy. This, her story's crazy. Um, and she's fighting for custody of her kids right now. So this, yeah. these are the things that are at stake. Um, our, our individual families, the children, the children that were possibly hurt. But the thing is, if, if they biblically, if we had done biblical things and brought these to light and to, it would have it exposed all the stuff that was going on in the leadership and, and so many more kids, so many more people could have been protected at that point. Um, so if we're not talking about these things, it's, it's detrimental. And I think that's when you, you brought up that it's, um, treat them as a non-believer. I've never thought of it that way, uh, the way that it was hitting me today, which is, they're not acting like a believer because a believer, one with the same heart and the same spirit, again, you are going to know each other's spirits yeah. and you're going to want to work things through it. You're not just going to buck up to somebody and say, well, don't question me. I'm the leader. I know what I'm doing. You don't understand. Um, so anyway, so when somebody's just trying to hide mm-hmm. and is not repentant and, um, and I also know, I also know this from, uh, What's at stake? So my marriage was almost destroyed. Mm-hmm. Uh, my husband and I tried to plant a church. So coming at this from a leadership, from a yeah. pastor side, yeah. um, we've I've personally experienced more hurt from being the pastors yeah, from being on the leadership side. Yes, than from just being in uh, as lay people. And I'd love for a podcast <laughs> to be on the pastors, oh, yeah. how pastors are hurt, um, yeah. because uh, yeah. Um, and it was partially because of the systems. Anything, anytime I brought a question, I was not allowed to question what they were doing. I was told I needed to detox some more. And then I was dismissed. And my husband, they were building him up and they kept dismissing me. And so then it started pulling, like putting this animosity between the two yeah. of us because we were no longer connecting. We were going to build together because we're mm-hmm. married. And we're yeah. supposed to do this um, in the within the biblical roles yeah. together, uh, and it, it just, it, yeah, it separated us. Um, so, and it took, I'd say there's still some things we're working out from that, and we're yeah. talking ten years to ago. twelve years ago. Um, mm-hmm. So, and and probably just started feeling healing about four years ago. Yeah. So, um, because we don't really talk a lot about it because we just don't agree. He has his perspective of what happened. I have mine yeah. and it just kind of, it stinks and it happened. But, um, so, so what's at stake? Families, um, the devil getting a foothold. And that's what it's all about. The devil is getting into this stuff. The devil's getting a foothold in these places. Yeah. And we're, if we just keep covering it up, what is that doing? That's allowing the devil yeah. to continue with that foothold. That's just not, it's not okay. And we've For got sure. to talk. 
and I, I think it's it's families, you know, I think it's futures and it's lives. That's what's at stake if we don't talk about this. Eternity. So is at I stake. I got mm-hmm. um a couple of messages just in the last few weeks, and we'll end on this. Um had a person I used to go to church with, I had a person that actually I hurt pretty deeply and uh probably had to repent to them more than you know, most people I've had to repent to in my life. And uh, we were talking about some things, and they, you know, they just said, "Hey, I haven't shared this, but I feel like I need to share this with you." You know, a um, little while back, I was suicidal, and I almost took my own life. And this particular pastor's name was in my suicide note mm. because when they refused to repent, the things they did hurt me so bad whether it was intentional, whether it was not, whether they agree or they don't, Mm -hmm. whether this person's totally right or not, doesn't matter. This pastor's name was in their suicide note because that was the reason that was leading them to want to take their own life. You know, had another person who has been very involved in their church, still is, and said, I felt like God was calling me to do this thing, really felt my, you know, my purpose, and, and I couldn't let go of it. Couldn't let go of it. It was everywhere, but every time I tried to talk to you know my pastors about this, they would kind of listen and then dismiss it because it didn't fit within the current system, didn't fit within the current institution. And then they would get kind of frustrated, like I was annoying them. Mm-hmm. And he said, it got to the point, he said, I'm embarrassed to say this. This is a Christ follower, mature Christ follower. I'm embarrassed to say this, but the truth is, they dismissed me so much, I started wondering, do I really hear from God? Right. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And because they asked that so many times... He said, again, I started thinking about taking my own life, mm-hmm. right? And again, this is a person that says, hey, I know that. That's not right. I'm looking at it, but I just I need, I need someone to talk through this with, right? Mm-hmm. And so, again, even if that's not the intention, mm-hmm. lives are at stake. Yes. Families are at mm-hmm. stake. Futures are at stake. And just like you talked about, Abby, with your friend's situation, if people had dealt publicly with the systemic and leadership issues, mm-hmm. the criminal issues would have never popped up. Right. Because they all came when the systems and leadership was not dealt with them. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, Because again, we've said this on this podcast multiple times, but if we allow spiritually abusive people, abusive leaders, you know, sexual abusers, doesn't matter. If we allow abusive people of any kind to stay in power, the longer they stay in power and the longer they get by with it, Mm -hmm. the more bold they'll become and the more they'll do. Yes. the more they'll try because they think no one can ever touch them. So it's mm-hmm. important that we bring correction. That doesn't mean removing people. It brings correction. Pastors only need to be removed over a few things. For the most part, they don't need to be removed if they repent. But if they can't repent, That's they need to be removed, right? right. So, yeah. um, But I just look at that. I look at that. The, 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 the stories that I'm hearing, I, I cannot. I, we, could, we could talk all day about stories where people's lives were in the balance, Um we talked about you know people never going back to church, eternities in the balance. So that's what's at stake. Mm-hmm. And it's why we have these conversations. And yet, when we have these conversations, I'll talk to people offline. I'll talk to them in the comments when they say, "I'll just hey, let's just totally get rid of the church. The church is the worst thing ever." I'm like, "No, I still go to a church. I'm still part of the church. I still believe in the church. I still believe we need the church." We're having these conversations and lovingly being a part of the church at the same time because. The church matters, but it's the ecclesia, the ecclesia first, not the institution, right? right? So this Holy Week, it's just a reminder, we have these conversations, we have these tough conversations, we're willing, for you as a listener, we got to be willing to have tough conversations that make us uncomfortable, that we're going to get pushback on, because people that Jesus died for are at stake, their families their futures, their lives, and their eternity. Nothing in the dark can heal. You have to bring it to light yeah. and, and the light of Jesus. Yeah. Well, Sean Reese, he's you know one of our, our co-hosts, and he says this a lot. He says what's hidden can't heal. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, we got to bring it in the light. So, yeah. And so. this is people's souls and salvation, period. Yeah. It's their life. And it's Jesus' sacrifice that did it all. That's yeah. right. So it's. I think it's a good reminder this week, especially mm-hmm. that all of the wounds, whether you're a pastor or whether you're a layperson, mm-hmm. um, all of the wounds can be brought to light, and it's safe in Jesus' light. And then He's healed it because of what He did during this week that we're remembering. Yeah. And if you've got a story to tell and you've not been able to get it out into the light, um, you can talk to us. We're going to keep that anonymous. We're not going to share anything, but we will listen. 
um, and let you get that out because that is healing. But this week for Holy Week, if you still consider yourself a Christ follower, and I know not all of our audience does, that's okay. Okay, we're, we believe, I'm a big believer that God is big enough. He's big enough to reach out to you, right? I don't, I don't, I don't have to make you feel bad because you don't believe what I believe, right? But we're praying for all of you. But if you call yourself a Christ follower this week, could I just encourage you, would your response to Holy Week simply be to love some people around you? How can I very practically love the people around me? Um, but when it does come time to speak truth, Speak that truth in love, but don't be scared to speak that truth because that truth is needed. So, guys, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for doing a really last minute, you know, kind of special Holy Week episode. Um, we wish everybody a happy Easter. Enjoy this time, and we'll be back with another episode of Church Disrupted next week. Grace and peace. Mm-hmm.